Please welcome Paul Hushow, partner at Canvas Ventures, and Anurag Gupta, VP at Amazon Web Services. Hey guys, how's everyone doing today? Thanks for having us. I always want to be a talk show host. I can't see you guys off, but um, thanks, Honor, for giving us the opportunity. So um, my name is Paul Schaub, general partner at Canvas. Um, joined the venture business uh, in 2003. The first two investments I worked on were Salesforce and Tableau. So you know, really come a long way. Sit on a few SaaS boards today. So privileged and excited to have Honor here. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he uh, joined AWS in 2011, mm -hmm. and leads their analytics and transactional database today. Um, you know, from a short span of six years, these guys have built a multi-billion ARR business. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into sort of how they did it, and it's just really it's exciting to have you here. Thanks. How did you get to AWS? So I was at um, a startup, which we sold to another company. You were on the board, of course. Yeah. And uh, so I s spent a couple of years there, you know, to get the handcuffs off. And uh, then at that point, I couldn't do another startup for personal reasons. And so it was a question of where to go next. And so the question I asked myself at that time was, so every, you know, it's easy to look back and figure out 10 years ago, what company would you have loved to have been joined at that time? Yep. So the question for me was, 10 years from now, what's the company I wanted to join now? You know, would, and you know, would have wanted to join now, and um, you know, Amazon and AWS really were at the top of that list. Yeah, Bezos talks about the the regret minimization. Sounds mm -hmm. like you went through a very similar thought process there mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So, what, what led you to AWS then? So, yeah, I'm a systems guy, and so if you look at systems, there are these points where things transition, like mainframe to mini computer, mini computer to PC. PC to um, intranet, intranet to cloud and mobile. Yep. And when you look at uh, those transitions, basically the whole stack has an opportunity to change. Yep. And so I saw the opportunity to change the stack. Got it. Uh, you know. And so, you know, if we think about it's being astonishing the, the depth of the innovation that you guys have introduced, the pace of the product, so that, that you, ha you have also done. And more importantly, I, I'm just surprised by sort of the business model, right? Mm -hmm. You guys have turned a lot of non-consumption clients into mainstream customers, mm -hmm. right? I guess questions about like, how do you guys approach this? Like, what sort of what what was the insight there that from such a short period of time, you know, you could actually come into the business and build such an offer? Yeah. So you're familiar with our working backwards process? Maybe um, I can fill you guys in yeah, a little please. bit. So you know what we do is before we write a line of code. We uh, work on the press release and uh, FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions document. And basically there are two problems when you're uh, building something, whether what people need and how, whether it's possible. And so whether it's possible takes a lot of time to figure out. Um, but <clears throat> what people need is actually a simpler problem. And in some, particularly for engineers, it's very easy to get wrapped up in the technology. And that's very different from figuring out what people want. Yeah. And so, no, for these big services, we like to go into large spaces because you're, you know, you're not going to get 90% of some small space. You're going to, you know, if you you want to do well enough, so even if you mess up, you're going to do pretty well, right? And it's a meaningful business. And then um, you know that you're going to go into a space where you're going to be, um, you know, feature poor compared to what people are at least when you launch, right? I mean, the, that's the general nature of minimum viable product, right? And so you have to look for an, a space of non-consumption. Yeah. And so one of the things when we started Redshift was this notion that, hey, enterprise storage, uh, the growth rate is about four times the pace of uh, data warehousing. Yeah. So why is that? And so you get into then with your customers figuring out why they're storing data that they're not analyzing. Yeah. Now that's a strange yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, right. And uh, so what we figured out is, is that it just wasn't simple enough, it just was too expensive, and was just too slow to put more data into these systems. Yeah. So you know, that sort of leads us to a somewhat different model yeah. than what they have today. 
I mean, gosh, congrats on the success, right? If I track you for the last six years, there's more than, what, 12 products from Redshift mm -hmm. to EMR to Elasticsearch and now most recently Neptune. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I sort of think about how we sit on boards where we dream about building a 100 million ARR, 150 million ARR in six years. It's incredible that you guys have built multi-billion ARR in, in the same time frame, basically from scratch, with a thousand X reach sort of a yeah. growth rate from. Yeah, I mean, we don't break out anything below the AWS level, but you know, we're pretty happy with where yeah. we are. Um, I worship these guys if it's not, if it's not obvious to you all. Um, what surprised you? So what uh, surprises me is, is that when I first joined AWS, it was a, a much smaller team than it is today, obviously. And, but the people in leadership roles are much the same. And so the ability to scale without going outside yeah. has been really impressive to see. Yeah. And do you, how is that? Like, how do you, you know, sort of, I think about, I sit on boards so of some of these SaaS enabled marketplaces. Mm -hmm. They are really powered by the services that you provide, right? I mean, like, from QuickSight and others, I, mean, I think about House, I think about uh, Transfix. It's incredible what you have done, but yet you held the headcount sort of the same. I'm just curious about what's the method, what, what about AWS that enable you to do so? So I think we think about scaling all the time. Yeah. And um, the key thing there for us is uh, really working through mechanisms because you know we have uh, Jeff has this famous statement that good intentions don't work. People don't come into the office expecting to mess up, right? And you know, if they do, you know, you've got bigger problems, right? Yep. And so the question is really, how do you create mechanisms so that you can uh, make things that are scalable? And so examples of that would be, uh, so you set a goal, maybe it's a revenue target, yep. and then you're gonna have um, trackable output metrics that drive that, and then you might have input metrics that drive that output metrics, and then you maybe recurse a couple of times to say, okay, we'll treat that uh, input metric as an output metric, what drives that one? And you know that just lets you watch the metrics, and yeah. then you can just focus on uh, the things that are doing really well, so you can double down on them, and the things that are doing really poorly, so you can you know, focus your attention, which is a fixed resource, and uh, apply into that, right? Because the things that are in the middle that's fine, right? Yeah, you don't yeah. have to pay that much. Is an example of a service that you guys have applied that methodology to? Really all of them. You do, right? Yeah, it's yeah. across so the board. Across the board, yeah. to Athena, you yeah. guys have done some yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So, switching topic a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have an amazing vantage point on the transformation that's really happening in the stack that many of companies here build on. Just curious about what you see you know, in the transformation right now. So, um, I guess I'd uh, look at the growth of data. I yeah. think that's been a really big deal. I mean, um, uh, I often, you know, my estimate is, is grow, data grows 10 times, uh, tenfold every five years. Yeah. And so that's basically three orders of magnitude every 15 years. So if you have a petabyte now, you're gonna have uh, a uh, exabyte in uh, 15 years. If you have a terabyte now, you're gonna have a petabyte in uh, 15 years. And that's a lot, right? And that actually, changes how you approach things because yeah. it used to be that you built these monolithic systems and then just for the, um, because of the growth of data alone, yeah. we've had to go to distributed systems, things like Hadoop, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also in the future gonna drive a move towards things like serverless yeah. and going to multi-tenant systems and pay for what you use yeah. in very small uh, request first. Yeah. And uh, you know we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, right. totally. I mean, I think the notion that you know I data that 10x every five years, um, I encourage you to name it Gupta's data law, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because in, you know on the venture side we've sort of followed the Moore's law for mm -hmm. many years. That's been the defining technology curve. And um, what's interesting is that with the data increasing 10x, there's just a lot sort of one mm -hmm. could do. And Moore's law is basically at a bit. It is, right? Yeah. And so then how do you drive the innovation based on the data that we are collecting? So I think, uh, I mean, data is really like potential energy. So yeah. it doesn't do you any good if you just yeah. store it away somewhere. But if you look at, you know, it used to be that uh, uh, voice syst re recognition systems were just garbage, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, if you ever had like a wrist that was hurt and you tried to use uh, one of those systems, you know, it would just, every word would have a, a mistake in it. Yeah. And now suddenly they all work. Yeah. Right. And 
Why is that? Well, you know, it's really two factors. One is, is that we have enough data to provide a, a meaningful corpus as a training set. Yep. And uh, we have inexpensive compute power that we can use to sort of you know, run the training models yep. on and just make them better and better and better. And uh, I think that's generally true across a lot of AI. And you know, AI has been um, a uh, pretty big uh, change in the industry. I think we're still in the hype cycle on it, but you know, maybe today, but you know, it's gonna be, I think, transformative. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that I've seen is, is that people's expectations change. Right, like you, you know, you start off and you're saying to yourself, "Wow, it's isn't it amazing? I can talk to uh, my phone and have it do something." And then, like two weeks later, you're like, "How ridiculous it, is it that I'm look on this voice, you know, conference and have to pack, tap things yeah, in totally. while I'm sitting, you know, trying to drive my yeah, car, totally. and you know, rather than just being able to tell it yep. and who I'm trying to talk to." And that intelligence, how you build into that software stack, makes a difference. That's right. As we talk about the data increasing so much, what are these data? Are these business data? Are they machine data? Like what, what, what are you seeing? Like what, like what, are, you know, what are we collecting here? Yeah, so I mean, at the highest level, I guess uh, the internet itself is a video serving platform, mm -hmm. right, with a small amount of data going on it. But yeah. just focusing on the data, you know, it's, there's this, you know, we used to think about data in terms of things like uh, business transactions. Yeah. So that's a tiny fraction of it now. Yeah. It's all really machine to machine now, yep. or it's internet scale consumer, yep. or, you know, and so forth. So the real question still is, you know, what do you do with it? Yep. Um, you know, I, might, I can give you an example maybe. And so let's uh, think about if I were building an expense reporting app um, five years ago, what would I do? Yep. So, you know, I'd obviously make it mobile first. I do gestures. Maybe nowadays I do voice, yep. you know, I'd focus on productivity and so forth. So that's all the uh, basic meat and potatoes, if you will, of uh, building something. And it's not particularly defensive. No. You know, because anybody else can do the same thing, particularly when they have my app to go and copy, if that's you right. will, right? And so the question the Jeff would ask. The yeah. software development stack is so easy now. Everyone that, could have these mobile sort of That's equipment. right. Yeah. And so, you know, the, what Jeff would say is like, okay, you've built a castle. Now the barbarians are coming to attack your castle. You know what you need? You need a moat around your castle. And so the question is, what's your moat? And so I think data is, presents a moat because it, there's a flywheel for it. The more data you have, the more use you can provide into it, and then the more data you have, right? Yeah. And those are positive things. Yeah. And um, an example of that, going back to expense reporting, is, is that if you think about it, expense reporting could be viewed as a productivity tool or something like that. But it's something more than that. It's actually a measurement of transactions or interactions between producers and consumers, right? Much like Amazon.com is. Yeah. And so if I'm a consumer, wouldn't it be great if I go to Kansas City to find out what are the restaurants that people like me right. you know, use? You know, very similar to like finding out a book. Or if I'm a producer, you know, where do I stack rank relative to other people and what could I be doing to make it better? Yep. Or if I'm a company trying to you know, provide this app, yeah. you know, how do I do automated acceptance of you know, like trivial transactions yep. to prevent people from dealing with them? Or like understand fraud where people are doing something where I can collect that. And what's great about that sort of domain in um, SaaS is, is that you don't have data for one company, no. you have data for a lot of companies. You do. And there's a positive uh, cycle there. The more data I have, the more useful it is, the more data I have, right? Yeah. And so that's, you know, I'm glad you went there. You know, it's a real shift away from It is, right? Process. Because when we think about, you know, having watched this industry for, gosh, coming out tw you know, 20, 30 years, but there was the semiconductor, that sort of innovation drove a lot of, and then mm -hmm. we put the ERP, CRM on the, the last, what, SaaS is now coming up 20 years old now. Mm -hmm. Right, we've gone to the cloud transformation, we've gone to the mobile transformation. It's harder to build that mode around SaaS. I mean, we mm -hmm. see the white spaces taking up, the pitches that come into our shops are, you, know, you target a particular vertical industry, like farming, like whatever the vertical in industrial might be, or you target the market segments, like an SMB or mid-market and start. Mm -hmm. We think about, like, how do you make that SaaS more intelligent, right? How do you build that something that self-learns? Mm -hmm. And that trained data is where something we think a lot about, like, can you put, can you actually incorporate the proprietary data into that SaaS stack? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Do you, um, one thing, if you look at the capabilities that Athena and all these have provided, 
it feels like everyone needs a data lake strategy. Mm -hmm. What is a data lake? So a data lake is basic, basically once you have a lot of data, you know, you need to put it into a central location. Yep. So, you know, in AWS, that might be S3, which yep. is our central repository. You know, I think of S3 as sort of like Chicago O'Hare. Everything can get into it, everything can get out of it. Yep. You know, so, um, and then around, you know, you want that data to be in some standardized open uh, format so that, you know, your the tools that you might use um, externally or the uh, tools that we provide, all of it can access it. You can't ha afford to have your data be trapped because yeah. it's way too expensive to move it around it. or change it or transform it or whatever. And um, so then you need a, a real portfolio of different uh, data analytics uh, capabilities around it. You know, so in our case, we have uh, serverless SQL in Athena or um, we have Hadoop in EMR or we have uh, um, you know, data warehousing in Redshift and you know, so on, so on, so on. And, uh, the real goal for us is to be able to provide something so you just throw your data in and the system will go and process it and understand it and so forth. You know, we're not 100% of the way there, but it matters, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you need to secure that data lake, of course, you know, because, you, you know, and then around uh, the basic core uh, data analytics, you need some form of AI, right? So you can really gain uh, in incremental value off of it. One of the things that we all struggle with is finding sort of, I mean, I think entrepreneurs here do as well is, the scarcity of finding data scientists, right? Mm -hmm. Including the data engineers. I'm just mm -hmm. curious about what you've seen and suggest the sort of recommendation on that as well. You know, I see a lot of people on LinkedIn who are suddenly data scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, you know, I think um, in some sense, um, the question really is what you need. You know, I don't know that it's about uh, data science and you know how many PhDs you can stack from uh, CMU or someplace yeah. like that. It's really about figuring out the value you're trying to give to your customer. It's very much back to that working backwards process yeah. of going and figuring out uh, what am I trying to do? If I'm trying to build a recommendation engine, then there are particular things I need. I need someone who knows recommendation engines, yeah. right? And the degree to which um, you can get, you know, the great thing is, is that most of the algorithms are well known, published, uh, you know, have open source formats. A lot of us uh, in the uh, you know, infrastructure industry are providing our uh, technology right. stacks in open source. Yeah. And so I think that, and you know, but the pace of innovation is really significant. So I think, you know, what people really need right now is uh, advice on what to do. Yeah. And then once they have, uh, a measure of advice, you know, the building part of it isn't, uh, isn't dramatically different. different. No. And you know, advice is, um, I don't know that you need in-house advice necessarily, depending on the size of your company, sure. right? Of course. Right. You know, we see, one thing that we see is, because that stack is, the capability coming from you is so sort of, you know, even though you're humble to say not full stack, but it's really a very complete, uh, if someone wants to actually have the data, like they can actually come to you. They want to integrate the data into this app, they, they can do that as well. One thing I think what's interesting is then the mode, right, Come, going back to the mode conversation is what's the proprietary data set that the individual customers have that can make it, that can feed into their machine learning model that will yeah. give them an edge on whatever they can do for their customers. That's actually a really important point because I think a lot of people when they set up their initial contracts with their customers, you know, they don't include, uh, you know, what rights that they have to the customer's data. Yeah. And that's an Im important question, and I think it's you know, we all sort of end up on these uh, systems, whether they're consumer or business, where every so often the EULA changes, and you just have to hit accept after paging through, you know, eight pages uh, right. before you can do anything. Yeah. But um, and that I think a large part of that is because you know people need uh, better access to the data, not because they're interested in invading your privacy, yeah. just because. They want to share it, aggregate it, figure out how, you know how to provide a better experience. Yeah. And so I think the degree to which we can, uh, you know, a company can set those things up qu yeah. easily, quickly, and so forth, yeah. removes those internal barriers because the value really is in aggregating a multitude of people together. Data. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we used to think about what's the IP rise, right? The software, you know, what is the IP stack? Nowadays, we ask a lot of questions to the companies that we fund. What's your data rights, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have the rights to, when your customers give you data or when you're collecting data from different sources, 
do you have rights to that? We've been surprised by some, how some of the large SaaS companies, as much as the talent-based machine learning mm -hmm. talent that they have applied to it, they actually can look into their own customers' data to mm -hmm. actually apply yeah. intelligence. I mean, you have to be very careful about it, yeah. right? Because, right. I mean. It's the privacy things here. Uh, well, and you know, it's the trust thing, right? You can't afford to break customer trust ever, right? Yeah. I mean, and if you're a customer-centric company, you know, like we aspire to be at yeah. Amazon, you know, I think you have to be very thoughtful about uh, what you're doing and yeah. why you're doing it, yeah. and that you're doing it in such a way that it really benefits the person who's providing you that information, not uh, you know, doing it in any sort of negative way. Yeah, totally. The um, shifting a little bit where you know we're seeing so much of the things is is global in nature now, mm -hmm. right? Just curious about what are you seeing on the, from that perspective? You know, a lot of customers want to have these. You know, multi-master data sets everywhere. How do mm -hmm. you, it, historically that's been a really difficult thing to do. I'm just curious about what you guys are doing on that front. So, you know, we're working on it. Uh, so, you know, projects are underway. We announced them in the most recent reInvent, uh, but it is a challenging problem. I think people have an expectation for low latency communication. And, uh, you know, if I'm playing Angry Birds in, uh, you know, San Francisco and I go to London, I expect the you know, to still be able to start that game from where I left it off, right? right. And uh, you know that what's true in consumer is equally true in uh, enterprise. enterprise, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's a funny thing that enterprise tends to trail consumer, yeah. is right? That right? Like the yeah. uh, you know, think about uh, messaging apps and you know, like the cost of them on the enterprise side versus the value of you get just by using, say, Facebook, yeah. right? And the yeah. pace of innovation on the consumer sure. and the simplicity of the experience and all the rest of those things. Yeah. And you know, the fact that you know, it's free, right? Uh, for me as a consumer, at yeah. least, right? The, um, when you think about your product and you know, people are thinking about, you know, we always talk about having product strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And now we think about coming back to the data rights a little bit, and even like global in nature, how do you think about data strategy? Like what's the tactical advice that you give to people when they like, is it just sort of even having a conversation on data strategy? Like when you get into sort of talking to, when you meet your customers, what is it that you want them to think about? Yeah, it's, uh, that's a really interesting question. I think, um, I, I frankly don't know. I think it, uh, you know, I'm not, um, a deeply strategic guy. I mean, my basic notion is do what my customers want and yeah. just like aggressively go and keep That's iterating right. because you know that way you don't, I don't have to think forward yeah. five years. I can think forward one Scrum. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, as or you know maybe a little bit longer than that if yeah. it comes to the question of something that's just fundamentally hard to do. Yeah. But um, you know, I think it's. You know, it's really just a question of understanding what your customers want from that side from a data right side, I think, you know, it's really just a question of understanding what one might want to do yeah. and uh, making sure that you handle the privacy considerations, yeah. particularly with, uh, you know, the European Union, GDPR and all right. of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, which I think is, you know, not just an EU issue, right? I mean, you know, you want to be able to do that for any customer anywhere. Uh, well, maybe another way to come at the question is like, if you think about the capabilities, the range, like the, you know, the 12, 15 products you have, mm -hmm. What is it that people, and, and we've gone from batch to real time, we've gone from sort yeah. of global in nature and, and the depth of the pipeline and data lake. Mm -hmm. What is it that people don't appreciate sort of how they should use these products yet? That I would see, turn, okay. That Got would it. turn that sort of that business advantage to them. Yeah, so you know, I think um, what's increasingly important, I think, is bringing simplicity for people. I see. And uh, so, I announced a bunch of stuff at uh, the past reInvent our AWS's user conference in November. And one of, I was pretty surprised that the thing that really most attracted people in the data space was uh, serverless. Mm. This notion that I'm just gonna send requests, the server spin up, spin down, resize, whatever. And uh, why, why would someone care about that? You know, it's just, I mean, you can kind of build that kind of thing on your own if you had to, right. but, um, I think the benefit is is that you know we kind of are increasingly in the world like ten years ago we were in the world where you had nine back end engineers to every front end engineers that's, right. yeah. that's flipped over right is now it? you've yeah. got uh, like one back end engineer uh, you know two or three ops engineers and the rest of them are front engineers which is awesome if you're an apps person because yeah. the front end is where you're providing value, value. right and yeah. you know 
So the degree You've taken to which the complexity we, out yeah. already on the back end. That's there. right, and the degree to which we can provide that simplification, I think, is ma matters a great deal. And it's you know, it's not just about AWS, right? There's so many um, app comp uh, sorry, yeah, API companies that are out there now, right? Like, if I, I previously, if I were creating an application, I'd have to burn like four engineers just on how to do payments, yep. and now I do an API call, and that's amazing, it right? Is. And um, we like to think of it as the application, the API yeah. application network there, right? How do That's you right. build software as a portfolio company, what, how, they, how they tied everything yeah. together? I think the next interesting thing is going to be how the SaaS companies themselves become API companies, right? No. Uh, like, you know, how do I integrate my expense reporting thing directly into somebody else's application no. so it's largely invisible? And, you know, it's, you know we think that having, um, you know, the you know, the time in front, you know, the screen time in front of the customer is valuable, yeah. but it's really the data that's valuable and, you know, attention's a scarce resource and there are only so many applications I'm willing to learn, totally. right? Like, right. I think we all probably installed 50 applications on our iPhones or whatever when we first got them and now we're using four or five, right? Yeah. Do you, so when you think about that, right, so coming back to that, how do you add intelligent back into the software stack, mm -hmm. right? Um, the notion of having that, you know, sort of that transformation where, where we're talking about, like going from SaaS to that intelligent SaaS, mm -hmm. and how do you build that, you know, mode, that data mode in there? Mm -hmm. Are there things that, you know, sort of people, the good practice that you're seeing people yeah. do right now? So, you know, I think uh, one thing is, is that um, the world moves to SaaS, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, it SaaS maybe arguably moment. has already, but right. you know, there's an awful lot that's still sitting in enterprise applications, sitting on premise, and you know, people don't want to work and be. You know, those applications basically treat you like a clerk, yep. right? You know, you have to spend um, a month learning how to you do order entry, and you know, I don't want to spend a month learning how to use order entry. Yep. You know, I, you know, or you know, like doing time off or any of the things that I end up having to do, right? Do I really want m small apps that are, in, you know, single purpose. Yeah. You know, I want them to have a trivial interface. I want them to be gesture or voice yeah. oriented to the degree possible. Yeah. And I want them not to bother me if they can do the thing themselves. Yeah. Right. And so that all turns into AI and so forth on the back end, That's right. and also automated integrations into. APIs between applications so that they're not asking me to carry a piece of data from one app to another. Yeah. I mean, you know, almost like the iPhone used to be, right? You know, uh, you know, it was transformative to say like, oh, I just read an email or pr I press on a, uh, you know, something that it recognized as a, a phone number and I'm placing a call, totally. right? And I, you know, but that doesn't seem to exist in applications today, right? That deeper integration yeah. in part because I think everyone wants to own the screen. They do. And that creates a really, I mean, I think it creates a really interesting opportunity even in an enterprise SaaS yeah. space, right? And particularly if you, uh, you know, try to monetize the API call. That's right. Right, because, and that's sort of where serverless yeah. comes in. If you can go to something where I'm not charging you on a per month basis or on a per year subscription yeah. basis, I'm charging you for what you use. Use. And, you know, I think that's been an interesting move, right? I mean, a large part of the innovation, I think, in uh, the cloud was this move from three-year TCO you know, pay uh, provision to peak yeah. to uh, pay by the hour. Yeah. And if you look at something like Lambda, which is our serverless compute offering in AWS, you know, it's pay per request in 100 millisecond chunks. And if you think about 100 millisecond, that uh, has the same ratio to an hour yeah. as an hour has to three years, that's right. roughly, that's right? right? And uh, that's, you know, I think if you, you know, and that's the model, I mean, that's, you know, so we talked a little bit about uh, non-consumption as a yeah. place to go. Yeah. The other interesting thing to do from a business model perspective is overconsumption, yeah. right? People using something that they're not uh, paying for something they're not using. The over-provisioning. Yeah, it's just yeah. useless, right? And uh, so, for example, if I had a uh, ETL tool yeah. and I, pay, you know, and I pay for it, and I'm running that ETL, my ETL jobs, you know, like eight hours a day. There's 16 hours where it's sitting idle. Why am I paying for it? Yeah. And you know, I think SaaS vendors have the opportunity to um, interleave usage. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you have to provision to peak just as I have to provision to peak, but my customer doesn't, and you know, your customer doesn't, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah, totally. Right? I mean, the challenge becomes how to make money at those price points, but you know, right. that's all about volume, right? One of the things we talk about a lot in in Amazon is how to run 
high volume, low margin businesses, right? And to just, you know, really pay attention to the underlying efficiencies. And you know, the, that also builds you a moat, yeah. right? Because the larger you are or, and the more you can take out of the efficiencies, you know, that only really comes with scale. That's right. And so you know, that's another positive advantage just as data is. You guys have brought the pricing to a level that's so much slower than everything else and made it on demand that sort of, in, but it created yeah. volume. Out, and you know, it's that. based in some sense on the intrinsic sense of optimism yeah. that the demand is there if I can find a price point and a, you know, and a product that people can afford. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming here and sharing your thoughts. I mean, um, round of applause for Anurag here.